Okay, well, this is Karen Keener of The Sovereign Mom, and I am just here today to talk about something I see often in what we might call the truther community. I don't really love that <laughs> because there's a lot of things I see coming out of the so-called truther community that I think are less than true, and those things are lie are exaggerations and embellishment and outright lies. So, um, why do I want to talk about this? Because it doesn't help our case as people combating lies and narratives based on conflation and lies and exaggeration, taking things out of context and out of proportion if we do the same thing, if we also distort how stories are coming across and distort reality really and I've noticed a lot in being on social media for a long time that there's this really I want to say intellectually lazy I think is what it comes from I do not think it's malicious I don't think that people mean to lie I think that oftentimes um, people believe they're speaking the truth when they are exaggerating. Um, maybe they don't know. And so they're speaking from a place of somewhat naivete or ignorance. Um, at any rate, it, it does not help the case of, like right now, we live in a sea of distortion and exaggeration. And what needs to come to that conversation is... You know, it's kind of like we're trying to fight fear with of a conflated outcome in a predicted mythological or could be mythological future with another fear and conflated outcome of a predicted. And sure, you can say if we continue to go down this path at this trajectory, this could be the outcome um, in a very short time. And that may be true. And I'm not saying don't say it or you're not allowed to say it or you don't have a right to say it or somebody should censor you if you say it. I'm not saying any of those things because I did do a big thing about opinions and I think it's important to have opinions and to separate our opinions not to have to say that we're giving an opinion like people should know that we're doing that right now I'm giving an opinion that's what I'm doing here however I'm making a plea here not a this isn't an a me telling you what to do this is me asking that if you are going to report the truth if you're not trying to propagandize people if you are trying to appeal to people's better nature through facts through um high-minded critical thinking logic and reason that you don't resort to the same tactics being used by people that like it's like okay this all is falling apart and so who do we rely on and there is a certain point at which I think people want to go rely on their cognitive dissonance will get them to, if, if they find lies here and they find lies there they're just going to pick the lies they like the best to listen to so if you have like the right wing would be attracted to the Q conspiracy theory because those people are obviously lying too but it's a lie that's closer to their fundamental belief system that they know certain things are not right they know there's com corruption in the government but they can't really put their finger on what con what of that is true and what of that is false and there are plenty of falsehoods out there but it's important to know what uh-uh sorry excuse me a second excuse me please use the other door Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> I didn't want them running through the living room while I'm doing my my spiel. <laughs> and I already asked them once. This is a second or third time I've asked, but at any rate, must have forgotten. Anyway, um, yeah, so my point get, that I'm getting to here in all of this is that continuing to say, okay, well, was there a strange illness that happened in 2020 that seemed to confound doctors and physicians that was 
beyond the scope of what what we would say we've seen before and that was somewhat novel and i would say absolutely yes and i think a lot of doctors would say yes was every single positive test that and i would say almost a hundred percent now <laughs> you know and then you look at the scope of the test if they'd been honest about the scope of the test the whole entire covid narrative was based a lot on conflation and hopefully i can say that in a video now without that getting it torn down i think we're for far enough along in this discussion to say yeah there was so much conflation happening between the numbers of positive tests that may have been false positive tests or it might have just been a test run at a certain um level versus you know reality and then when you weighed all of those things out we might have made uh, collectively people humanity might have made safer decisions for themselves about what to do or what the level of actual threat warranted you know we're talking about monkeypox now is the next thing i mean <laughs> i guess that's what we're calling it the next thing um and are we looking at that with the same level again we're talking about you know less than three four less than four thousand cases in a specific community of high risk the rest of the world has basically zero risk and are we going to allow conflation, exaggeration, and false predictions um, based on flawed computer models where they exaggerated the outcome? Hello, now I've got a fly in here. <laughs> That's what happens when you hold the door open. Um, anyway, um, and I guess he's going to be my friend for this video. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh when you have these kinds of conflations happening in the world, like what we've just lived through for a couple of years, and then you have predictions that are clearly flawed, that don't, sh like, when they finally, when the WHO finally had a gal come out and say, no, 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 this, th we are not seeing the real world data that these are going to escalate to this percentage of whatever the population um, being hospitalized or dead or whatever. But then they, they said, we're not seeing that happening over the, you know, two weeks and since and whatever. I don't know if it'd been four weeks at that point that they came out and said, oh, these predictions are flawed. They said they still had a week. The next day she came back and rolled it all back and said, but there's still computer models that show this could be real. And it's like computer predictive models with really high levels of exaggeration and conflation of the worst case scenario said this. So that's what we're going with is the worst possible, like, like the least likelihood of the worst possible scenario. And we're going to make decisions for everyone's lives based on that. And I just don't think that people should, I think we all... I would hope that we would all start to take a step back and go, maybe, maybe we won't do that again this time. You know, maybe we'll reconsider making decisions based on what may be the worst possible prediction of something to come that is the least likelihood. And, and, but again, you know, we have the news just going <laughs> ape shit about monkeypox, which is funny. Um, but the reality is it's just not really there. It's just not. Um, the, the, the threat, the constant whatever of, you know, less than 4,000 people among, you know, over 350 million is not a, a, something that should be on the news every night and making people concerned and making people run out and get a, a vaccine that's experimental. And again, we don't know how well it will work on mon monkeypox really, since we haven't had enough cases ever in the history of ever to know that it's that effective on a broad scale or whether it's worth giving to a large amount of the population. Um, even when smallpox was a problem, what solved it was not mass vaccination, but targeted vaccination of what they felt were the most likely sufferers of the disease. They, they, they picked the population that were the most vulnerable. Um, 
And I'm not even sure that that's really what brought that down, but that's what the history books say or suggest or whatever. And so I think this is where we're going to have to like look again at things from a reality, from realistic perspectives and come to a responsible, reasonable conclusion of what we think we should be doing to solve minor problems if they even need a solution at this point. Why am I talking about all of this? Because we are countering these same kinds of lies and conflations where the news blows up a teeny tiny thing and mount, like makes a mountain out of a molehill and then tries to use, you know, mountain moving uh, regulations and restrictions and uh, just different ways of like forcing the public to do certain things to try to combat that molehill. And, or it's not even that, it's like a little tiny ant hill, you know, it's, and then we're using all of this stuff to like, we have to move this mountain because this, this ant hill could be a mountain. And so we need to like attack this problem like it was a mountain, as if it were a mountain based on, again, projections that are wildly inaccurate or have been recently proven to be. So the problem is with all of that conflation on that side, a lot of people are leaving. And so we should be able to use a certain level of level-headedness to combat that kind of mentality that we should take this, you know, mountain-moving approach to inhibit this anthill. Um stomp it out forever, you know, and we did that. We stomped it out forever at the beginning of COVID and it's just become a problem that has been running unabated. There's not less hospitalizations really from start to finish based on any of the measures that we have put into place. It's just less, you're hearing about it less on the news and hospitals are facing a real problem of being significantly um, shorted of healthcare providers because of those regulations, those restrictions, those things that people did to try to counter this ended up losing the hospital system. A lot of people that didn't want to go along with that kind of, they didn't want to get the vaccine. They didn't want to go along with some of that stuff. So I'm bringing this up because as people are looking for a level-headed response to what seems to be this whatever problems are happening. There's people that are seeing through some of the BS. Those people aren't seeing through the BS so they can get involved in more bullshit. They are not seeing through the BS so they can hear more lies. And Their bullshit detectors are up for lies and exaggerations and conflations. And if you're exaggerating, if you're going, well, everyone, that you know, and a friend of mine recently was like everybody on Rogan is a Jesuit puppet or some nonsense and I was like are you kidding me what what does that even mean like that he has like what almost a thousand guests on Joe Rogan a year and you're saying every single one of them is part of some cabal working together again that's people just lived through hearing conflation. And when they now when they hear conflation and exaggeration, they're going to run the opposite direction. If you want them to sit and listen to what you have to say, that might be of value. The last thing you want to do is to present them with conflation as a reason to listen to you. <laughs> like Everybody is little, and, and, and so, yeah, you will attract a certain few number of people that understand the scope of what the problem could be if it went the worst way, blah, blah, blah. Okay, but that's what the other side is doing, too. They're appealing to a certain amount of people, considering the worst case scenario and trying to treat the threat as the worst case scenario. I, it, like, we need to all focus on our lives, not fear. When we're in fear, we're like blinded by it and we run around chasing our tails and we don't know what to do next and we're not clear-headed and we're not reasonable and we're not coming up with the right responses, clear responses, um, 
good at sound action taking, good sound reasoning and all. We need to, all of us, maybe take a step back, take a breath, come to a point of clarity and reasonability and sensibility because the people that are defecting from this system of lies and exaggeration and conflation and embellishment those people are looking to hear something that sounds grounded in reality not just facts because we can go oh these are the facts but if we disproportionately like clump all the facts that we like together that's called bias that's not the truth a bias is not the truth so so i used to have a fun spiritual teacher that used to say these may be the facts but they're not the truth and when you look at it that that's an interesting thing to say that facts are not necessarily equal to the truth because if you're not looking at facts in proportion again it's like if you go oh my gosh the number of monkeypox cases has gone up this year and it's increased by such and such percent but it's like among how many people among which group of people in a population of what you know and then when you look at it to that it's like all of a sudden this big problem it sounds like it's just growing bigger and bigger all of a sudden when you say out of 350 million people it's nothing it's gone and so we have to say, yeah, that is happening. And yes, that increase is happening. And yes, that increase is, you know, somewhat problematic. We'll keep an eye on it. That's all. It shouldn't be like everybody run out and get treated for this thing and acting like madness. And I think that's where we have right now in our world where we are tending to madness. And in tending to madness, what do we lose? And I suggest that what we are losing when tending to madness is our sense of purpose, uh, hearing a higher calling, what we really need to be focused on in our lives, our creativity, looking for solutions that might not be like cut and dry, laid out for you by a system that is using their solutions that they give you, that they propose to gain control. So a sense of creativity, a sense of peace. We are losing our peace when we give in to fear. So we need to keep our heads on straight and stay in a peaceful. And so that's why looking at the facts in proportion, looking at the facts with a sense of reason, with a sense of calm headedness, with coolness is what is going to lead us out of the madness. We're not going to get out of the madness using a different brand of madness or more madness. I mean, you want to talk about left and right being like this like dichotomy of like voting in the United States, but you also have like this crazy versus that crazy. It's still madness. And so I don't care if you think you're a truther and you think you're on the right side of madness, like you're with the good guys of madness, you know, you're with the good guys who exaggerate and lie and conflate and manipulate people into fear based responses and away from their innate intelligence to be calm and rational. You're not really the good guy then, are you? You're just another version of lesser evil, the like lesser evil of two choices that you don't have to make. And so that's why for me right now, it's like I'm watching this kind of go on and play out and I'm watching people really cling to the lies and the conflation. And it's a little disheartening, but I'm glad to know that there are people that are still speaking the truth. <laughs> Not speak truth, speak truth. Let's speak truth. Kamala Harris the biggest liar, but I, I'm saying that there are people that are speaking sensibility and they're talking to our sensibilities and they're talking to us calmly and they are giving you a sense of peace when they speak to you. And I think there are a lot of people that are living without government, we'll say, uh, they're mentally not wrapped up in government. They're not wrapped up in the latest thing and the latest problem. 
and they're living their lives and they're living their best lives right now. And they are doing things that will prepare them for the future, which I think is really important, you know, because when you are starting to live a life where you do see that there are growing problems with structures of control taking over, you know, that all these different food companies are really owned by one larger company. And so you realize that food security could be a problem in the future. And that there is a way to use your resources, your time and your talents right now to just take care of yourself. Not everybody, not fix the whole world, not freak out and go, oh, we're all going to die. Kiss our asses goodbye. Fuck, it's all over now, you know, or whatever people are doing. We don't have to do that. We don't have to scare people into, you know, um, thinking about food security. We don't. We can just say, you're a calm, reasonable, sensible person. Think about what you want to do with your future. And I think this is where I came to because for some reason, and I'm trying to figure out what that is exactly, when I first saw that the government was corrupt and immoral and its power structure was gained illegitimately, like as in not according to a code of ethics. It was unethical. How, If you want to not use the word morality because you don't like that word, it was unethical. And I realized, okay, then the rest of this is going to be up to me about like checking to make sure my food is safe enough. I'm not going to be necessarily relying on the government for that. I, if I don't want to rely on the government for that, what do I have to do? And I asked myself a lot of questions about what if this system it wasn't there? What if that system that the government runs wasn't there? What things would I need to do? And I was living in an apartment and I was feeling really sorry for myself. I was feeling really sad and I was feeling like, oh my gosh, like, I'm just a, you know, gnat in the wind, you know, <laughs> nothing, like, I don't have any, there's nothing I can do in my apartment. I live on a second story. I have a concrete little balcony patio. What can I do? And then I was like, I can do whatever I can do right here and now. And that's when I bought planters. I bought like you know, I found like a really, I didn't have a lot of money. So I found this really cheap, it was just like a metal bar and a like a kind of like a plastic tarp material um, thing that was made to go inside this little metal frame and hold your soil. And I planted pumpkins and tomatoes and all kinds of things that I've never gotten to grow in my, <laughs> my dirt in my house now. Um, I grew the greenest tall it was as tall as as me like i couldn't see over it it created security for my apartment because nobody could see in anymore because i had plants from the ground to higher than me uh, tomato vines and all kinds of things growing out there on that patio that it was like a little patio food forest and i was shocked at what i was able to do once i stopped telling myself a story that there wasn't anything I could do because of these circumstances and these circumstances and not having enough money and I haven't and I just was like if I have a little bit of money I'm just gonna buy some dirt with it you know some really good potting soil some really good this I'm gonna get a little can for watering and, and you know like little things that you can do little by little when you decide I don't want to be reliant on this system forever and there's all kinds of little baby steps we could all be taking. And so I talk to a lot of people that I call my tribe, my people, the sensible ones, the ones that are doing what I'm doing, where we're, we're out there trying to make food for ourselves and grow some percent of our food. If even if it's a half a percent of our food, we're trying to do something about where our meals come from and that something each meal comes from my garden, you know? Um, and when I talk to these people, it's very interesting. I get a totally different vibe from them, a sense of sensibility about, even about anarchists and voluntarist principles. They don't sit on a high mighty throne of what those principles are. They sit in a pragmatic seat. And almost all of them unanimously sit in a pragmatic seat of these things are much harder to do 
than we thought they were going to be. These things are require a lot of effort and a lot of sacrifice more so than we thought and we can see why a lot of people may not want to choose this lifestyle if they don't have to however we also see that this is kind of the only option the only way forward is try to do something and 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 this is a really interesting thing because there's a lot of people that are like well I just can't do anything throw my hands in the air or whatever you know or I'm just gonna do this little thing that I do or buy to make all these things you know and and I just see a just a totally different mindset among what I would call my tribe out there that are just more practical about homeschooling <laughs> Because they're doing it. It's not like, oh, homeschool. Everybody should homeschool. Homeschool is just an ideal. And it's like, you don't realize most of homeschoolers may have one car. Uh, if the other parent is not working, they're trying to find something to do desperately to make a living or to bring in some money while they're staying home with the kids, which is a quandary. You know, there's just so many things that are like, <sighs> much harder than everyone poor you know if it, easy if you don't have kids a lot everything is easier when you don't have kids and that's another thing I think people with kids understand it's easier to say you're going to do this or you're going to do that as an anarchist if the government comes after you if you don't have kids that people with kids understand is this a different game and a different boat and a different ball of wax and so I think that there is a tendency to embellish or exaggerate what that lifestyle would look like in a utopian sort of way. I mean, they call it libertopia, some people, because, or, you know, or anarchotopia or whatever. It's still sort of a fantasy for a, for a lot of people. Most people are like, even Jack Spearco runs the survival podcast. The guy has all of this stuff and he still is like, I'm not completely self-sufficient, you know, or I'm not, you know, completely, uh, you know, you know, it's like the guy teaches people how to survive and acknowledges where his limits are and he sees them and he knows them. And I think that's one of the differences of people that are trying to do more and take care of more is they always see where they can go next or become better. And where I see a lot of people think, <laughs> I think that have no kids, they're not homeschooling, but they're talking a lot about it. They are not growing a fucking thing. Like I'm talking about people that probably have like a penthouse apartment that doesn't even have a single little herb garden in it, okay? And these people are like, I'm just going to buy land and then <laughs> I'm going to home. And when I have kids, I'm going to homeschool my kids and I'm going to buy land. doesn't matter where it is. I mean, I haven't really thought about that. I'm just, they don't think about any of that stuff. They're just like, I'm going to buy land and I'm going to have kids and we're going to homeschool. And we're going to do this and we're going to do that. And it sounds so fucking stupid to anybody that's attempted homesteading. It, you sound like idiots, like total idiots to some of us and it, I, I I hate to say it it just sounds like naivete and I'm tired of those people like looking down their noses at the less principled people that are like actually doing the shit you know it's a little exhausting for some of us um but again we have our tribe we know who they are they're not those people <laughs> Not that you can't join us. We would welcome you. But it's like when you're thinking about, I mean, when you're thinking about, you know, buying a house or building houses or building earth ships and you're talking about, you see somebody do it in the desert and you know that can be done. It doesn't mean that's what you want to do, right? Just because somebody did something and they made it work in an inhospitable place means that's what you're going to be able to do with children, especially small children and babies, and it doesn't mean you're going to be able to do all those things in 
your circumstances. Like you don't know what in your life might happen that might make that a really bad idea for you. But it made it great for some single guy to go prove he could live in the desert and live off the land and build an earth ship and make it, you know, cultivate and invite a bunch of people out to help him build it, you know, that wanted to take a class from him on building earth ships. And all of these things that happen that people do, yeah, that is inspiring that it can be done. It should inspire you to look at your circumstances in your life and see what you can do with what you have now. But it doesn't mean that you're going to just be willy-nilly about life in general and just go, well, I bought some land in the flat, sandy desert of Arizona and I'm going to make a make a homestead here. You know, like <laughs> maybe, maybe have the soil tested first just as an idea because <laughs> like I said, we're running a place. It looks really fertile, but we've got all kinds of soil funguses we've been fighting the entire time we've lived here for a year and a half and all kinds of other things and not a lot of money to like fight that problem and and not a lot of people close to us and that we have met until more recently to help us deal with that or contend with it. So it's one of those things where you want to start to build your tribe, which we're doing now and to build tribe not just of people all around but of locals too and to be able to start setting up things where you're helping each other and doing more for each other and coming together in practical ways we need people to help us um there's no getting out of this without that and not all the people that just think government is evil are going to necessarily be your tribe. Like there's a lot of people that think government is evil and they're out of their fucking minds or they're off their rocker or they're just living off a different set of values and ideals and, and for a different vision than the one that you hold and have and cherish. You know, there's a lot of things that make you friends with someone and acquaintances with someone and get along with someone, but not necessarily tribe with someone, not necessarily like the old fashioned sense of what we used to call a family or a tribe in a traditional sense. And I think we are breaking down society is coming to a head where I do see it starting to unravel a little bit. And this community building will be a great way to get us back together but we're gonna have to do that community building based on honesty honesty comes from looking at the facts without disproportionate and you know uh conflation of certain facts absent the the whole you know like i said the the, the four thousand monkey pox compared to 350 million population we're going to look at things more pragmatically in a smaller group of people and figure out how to work on things. But we're going to have to be honest. And honesty means to understand what your biases are and to be able to look at how those biases may be helping you, but also how those biases may be holding you back. If you have a belief system that things are just going to keep getting worse, for example, or things are going to keep going terrible, you can look at it with like a certain amount of practicality of like, yeah, that helps me to build up more of my self-reliance. But you could also take it to the next step where it keeps you from trying to contribute to things going well and doing things that might lend to a better world. It may stop you from trying to vision a better world right now without things falling apart first and everybody killing each other or whatever other plans that you know could happen in the worst case scenario if can things continue to go a certain way or direction or whatever you know so i really hope people take the time to listen to this plea to start being honest to start looking within ourselves at our biases and to hold them in a proper perspective to bring those perspectives to light um and to keep those at, as a strong, calming, sensible, and centering focus so that we aren't as judgmental of other people that are trying to do things and are struggling to make them happen. Um, but also 
you know, at the same time, being gentler on ourselves, not being able to do certain things and make them happen. You know, that uh, perfectionism is just another, what did they say? Perfection is the enemy of the good or whatever. Um, the perfect is the enemy of the good. Is that what it is? That we may be able to start looking at ourselves on it, honestly, look at ourselves within and evaluate what what values that we hold and cherish most and a vision for a future that we want to live and even if it looks like this obstacle of the impending reality of doom <laughs> isn't before us that we keep our focus much clearer on the vision that we want to have and keep that in our center, what I call, I say, in our boundaries. And keep more focus on what we have in our boundaries than what is out there, the impending doom that we don't want to have, that we want to say no to, that we want to stay off. You know, we're going to build ourselves up against that impending doom by looking at this vision. Not by looking at the doom and going, what am I going to do to stop it? Ah, you know then we end up not letting in the things that maybe need to come in and need to help us change and need to help us in ourselves become bigger people so that we can withstand whatever those storms are. But but again, staying focused on the higher vision. And the higher vision may have nothing to do with the impending doom and it might not be affected by the impending doom, you know. <laughs> And the impending doom might not even be real. It might just be a big fucking fake false lie, you know, or exaggeration or conflation. So we don't need to build up our own dooms and our own exaggerations even to ourselves. So it's not just like what we're purporting to others. It's turning them away. It's also how we are doing this to ourselves. Anyway, I'm doing a workshop, as you guys know. Um, in the, in a few weeks, I'm going to be doing a three day workshop. It's going to be about a half hour and a half, 90 minutes to two hours each day of these three days. It's going to be ridiculously inexpensive and it's about looking and evaluating your own values, um, getting a clear picture of your vision and some different tactics that you can use to stay focused on your values and visions and helping you create tribe. That's the main focus of this is to use all of these tools that we're going to have. We're going to put all these tools together and then we're going to figure out how that we can use them to draw in our tribe, to create tribe, to find tribe, to go out and find these people, but also to magnetize them to us through our clarity of our vision and values and being open about those things and focused on them to the point of attaining those different various goals for our own future. That is, workshop is um the doors will be open to purchase your ticket to this workshop uh it's going to be experiential it's going to be on zoom so anybody can do it that has a computer or a phone smartphone or some kind of device that connects to the internet and it, it, or you can watch it at, if you can't be on the lives, you can watch it later. I'll have the recordings available. So if you just want to buy it so that you have the recordings, um, and that is all going to be open on Monday. So if you want to get in on that, you need to subscribe to my Substack because that's where the announcement's going to be. And that's where all the links are going to be. It'll be here too, but you may miss it. And so having the subscription to my Substack will make sure that it gets directly to your inbox when this opportunity opens opens to have all these tools to not be alone to learn about your vision to stay focused on it um so yeah it'll be there and so I hope that you guys come and participate in this because it's going to be super fun we'll probably meet some people that are already like-minded just because of the fact that they're drawn to something like this they're already going to share some of your vision and values um so you will already start making tribe just by being there. I'm sure of it. And so that the doors for that workshop will be open on Monday, this coming Monday, the 8th. That's my son's birthday, his 10th birthday. Very um, uh, synchronous time or not synchronous, but, but auspicious date. <laughs> 
So I'm looking forward to sharing that opportunity to join this workshop and to join a start to create a little community within that um, group of people that are going to be part of this. This is the first one of its kind. So I'll be looking for people that want to give me some feedback, hopefully. Um, it's going to be very inexpensive. It's going to be cheaper for paid subscribe. It's going to be cheaper for subscribers and cheaper still for paid subscribers. So you definitely want to get in on those deals and discounts. Ooh, I got a little, that little fly just wants to be part of my tribe. <laughs> I'm so attractive. <laughs> Hello, gorgeous. Anyway, so I would love to have you guys there. So again, my Substack for all of you that are waiting to hear is thesovereignmom.substack.com. And I hope that you join there and become a subscriber so that you get a little discount. And if you become a paying subscriber for just $9 a month, you're going to get a huge discount. So you're going to save a lot of money doing that. And I look forward to seeing you all in the workshop coming up and um, joining, signing up and buying your ticket on Monday. All right. Love you all and talk to you soon. Bye.